District of Conservation is sponsored by CFACT. To learn more about our sponsor, head over to cfact.org. Thank you so much for listening. Welcome to District of Conservation. I'm your host, Gabriella Hoffman. This podcast offers a sober examination into all things hunting, fishing, shooting sports, energy, environment, and the public policy surrounding it. And this podcast also specializes in original interviews that you won't hear elsewhere. Here's what I have for you today. I'm sitting down with Amy Swearer, a legal fellow at the Edwin Meese III Center for Legal and Judicial Studies at the Heritage Foundation, which is one of the most foremost conservative public policy think tanks in the United States. I have long wanted to sit down with Amy after seeing some of her testimony before Congress and also learning, of course, in this town, in the Beltway, and if you work in firearms policy, you know someone who knows someone who knows them. So we all kind of are in similar circles, and she's impressed me so much with her scholarship, her research, and just her knowledge about the different issues at bay as it relates to firearms policy. And Amy and I go deep into their defensive gun use tracker why the media obscures the truth about reporting on the subject. We talk about some serious holes in investigations relating to one of the recent shooters out of Colorado Springs and kind of some interesting studies and and things that we wish people in media and academia would do more to highlight defensive use of firearms and kind of counteract some of the blatant negative kind of nomenclature and negative kind of attitudes that are always assigned to gun ownership in this country, even though it shouldn't, when people are lawfully owning guns. So I hope you guys enjoy my conversation with Amy. Let me know what you think. Amy, thank you so much for coming to the podcast. Great to have you on. Thank you so much for having me. I'm, I'm really excited. Could you introduce yourself to my listeners and explain your background? Sure. My name is Amy Swear. I am a legal fellow in the Edwin Meese Center for Legal and Judicial Studies at the Heritage Foundation, uh, which is a conservative policy think tank in in Washington, D.C. And for the last five or so years, uh, a lot of my my scholarship, my, my writing, my congressional testimony, those sorts of things, it's all focused, not exclusively, but to a, a very large extent, on the Second Amendment, on gun violence, understanding gun violence, um, understanding how to combat it from a conservative standpoint, uh, while still uh, respecting the the Second Amendment rights of law-abiding citizens. Um, And all of that has uh, really, it turns out, uh, been connected to a lot of mental health discussions. Um, So I've done uh, quite a bit of like mental health policy and and some of the overlap between mental health and, and violence and criminal justice reform, because it's all very much interrelated. Um, but that that has been the, the thrust of it uh, for the last five years or so. And at some point recently, I remember seeing your testimony, but for my listeners who don't know, you testified before Congress and one individual member skewered you. Can you describe <laughs> that moment? What happened? Um, yeah, so th- this was this last summer. Um, at, a, at a certain point, you, you just get a little tired of, of talking about it. But uh, no, I, I got into a little bit of a tiff with uh, Representative Katie Porter, um, who, you know, instead of dealing with the question at hand um, and, and anything related to what that hearing was about, uh, decided to misrepresent testimony from like three years ago, uh, accused me of perjury on on national TV. Um, and then, of course, you know, did not give me a chance to respond uh, and, and reclaimed her time because it was never it was never about the, the truth of what I had said. It, it was about her, you know, 30 second soundbite to sell to constituents. Um, but that that sort of, you know, comes with the territory of of being involved in. I mean, like the gun violence is, is a very emotionally laden topic. Um, you know, gun gun policy is, is a very contentious world. Um, and so I think it's unfortunate that a lot of times those conversations, you know, boil down to outright slander in in that case instead of dealing with the substance, um, because it is such an important topic. Uh, you know, you, you're literally talking about the, the difference between life or death a lot of the time. Um, but yes, that uh, between that and and some testimony from 2019 that went viral, 
Uh, you, you may have seen me on YouTube for those reasons. The chief focus of your research and scholarship recently has largely been de- dedicated to defensive gun use. And as a reporter myself and commentator, I always hear and I follow and I have to respond to often, and I have over the years, much like Stephen Gutowski and others who cover this beat very closely do, we've had to respond to mass shootings, the coverage related to that. How do we counter these horrible incidences with kind of a case for lawful gun ownership. And it's Mm -hmm. tough at times, of course, but Heritage Foundation, and I think um, especially with you at the helms of this particular project, has really tried to, I would say, contextualize the good guy with a gun can stop a bad guy with the gun moniker and actually Mm -hmm. prove that that is true. It's not just a catchphrase. It's not just something invented by gun rights supporters, Second Amendment supporters, gun manufacturers, what have you. And so you guys have definitive concrete evidence and you have a lot of data and articles that highlight some recent incidences of people uh, engaged in defensive gun uses. So what propelled the project to come about? Yeah, so this this was started um, in, in 2019, actually a little bit before that, um, in, in 2018, when we started really thinking about this, um, because you, you can go through and look at the cold hard data right, uh, about defensive gun uses. And like, I mean, th- this should not be controversial. This is the CDC, not not exactly, you know, a pro-gun organization um, ha- has come out in their own report and said, look, w- when you look at all of the, the comprehensive studies on defensive gun uses, almost all of them find that Americans use their guns defensively somewhere between 500,000 and about 3 million times a year. Now, I think the best of those studies, and including the, the most recent ones, uh, I, I think that number's probably between 1 and 2 million uh, a, a year, um, just, you know, as a as a general gist of, of I think, what the best studies show. Um, but even the ones that don't are, are still showing about 100,000 defensive gun uses a year. And you look at the national narrative on this, and all you see is defensive gun uses are rare. They never happen. Uh, it's a, The good guy with a gun is a myth. And the data is objectively the opposite. Um, so our goal uh, was, was to, to sort of look for a, a way to contextualize this for people. Like it's one thing to hear that data. It's another thing to understand those stories um, and, and to put a, a context and names and faces um, and, you know, bring it down to, you know, when have these happened in, in cities near you? Uh, because we, we started looking into this and it turns out, uh, you know, you have databases for all of these different types of gun violence. But there really wasn't at the time, you know, th- there is sort of a, another one now, though I, I have issues with it. But, but at the time, there really wasn't a database and, and certainly not any sort of interactive, you know, attempt to bring this to the American people. Uh, and, and so we started digging into it and we now have uh, launched our defensive gun use database. Uh, it's an interactive map. You can see all of the stories uh you know, broken down by year or within the last 90 days, you can see the stuff that has happened near you because a lot of times these stories come up, um, you know, they're, they're just little blips on the news. Um, they may not even make it out of the local pe- paper. Sometimes they don't even make it out of a police report. Um, and, you know, we, we just thought it was very important for people to get that general understanding. Um, so now we have thousands and thousands of these are all media verified reports, um, you, you know, things that that were so substantive, uh, often because shots were fired, you know, so someone was shot, um, or it's a very, you know, like news hooky type of story. Um, and we know it's just the, the tip of the iceberg, right? Um, so we, we know from talking with gun owners and from just the general context of these surveys that most of these defensive gun uses don't even get reported to the police, much less make it into a police report, much less, you know, then, then get picked up by the nightly news for that blip. Um, you know, for, for a variety of reasons. Um, but even then, just media verified reports, thousands and thousands of these cases, um, so much so that we've started publishing, you know, we, we now have a, a Twitter account, we have a, a sort of best of highlights of the month. Um, and again, I, I just think it's really important for people to see, you know, these are not, uh, you know, vigilantes, uh, or, you know, people sort of on the fringes of society. These are normal, ordinary Americans who were just going about their everyday life and, and crime found them and they happen to be prepared 
and, and willing and capable of protecting themselves, protecting others, um, you know, d- defending life, liberty and property in all of these situations where the, where law enforcement, you know, try as they might simply cannot be there to protect them. Uh, and so that was our goal with it. And, um, you know, we're always looking to to expand it. Um, but I, I think it has been a, a very, very important tool uh, that I'd, I'd highly recommend to anybody who's interested in in seeing what these defensive gun uses are all about. What has been the response to the project? I bet you guys probably get the routine. Well, it's Heritage Foundation. They're not legitimate on this. Aside from detractors saying that, what has been the general response? Has it even creeped into mainstream media outlets citing you guys? Um, despite the usual people who are detractors, you're never going to convince certain segments of media or commentary kind of spaces. But what would you say the general perception of the project has been? Well, look, I, I think that the general perception has been good. I think a lot of people are are surprised. Um, you know, we have done our best to the, the last thing you want, especially because we so often and I think rightfully so look at other you know, gun violence databases and and the way that they sort of mischaracterize or, you know, uh, you know, expand the definition of mass shooting um, for political purposes. And, and so we wanted to make it solid. You know, we, we didn't want we wanted these to be legitimate defensive gun uses by law abiding citizens, um, you know, not just, you know, yeah, you 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 defended your home, but the four guys broke into your home because you're the neighborhood coke dealer sort of thing. Um, you know, and I think a lot of people were surprised that we we took those steps to make sure that it it was legitimate, um, that we're not padding our stats. But I think more than that, I, I think you've seen a lot of, you know, just people who haven't really thought much about the issue of, of defensive gun use or, or, you know, aren't necessarily watching their local news every night, um, being surprised by just how often this is happening in their own neighborhoods. Um, you know, just how often concealed carry permit holders, for example, um, are actually stepping up. How often individuals, uh, you know, lawful armed civilians are stopping would be mass shooters. Um, you know, a lot of times those stories don't become big, you know, public, um, headlines simply because the mass shooting didn't happen, right? Um, you know, that's much less of a, a newsy quote unquote story than, when no one is there to to, to stop it. Um, and so I, I think that has been surprising to a lot of people is again, to put that, that name, that face, that very real life scenario to those, those cold, hard numbers um, to, to, to give sort of life to the data has been so important. Unfortunately, the old maxim or old adage, if it bleeds, it leads still dominates gun coverage. Although I would say mm-hmm. For the most part, local media does a pretty stellar job of being fair and impartial. And some of the legacy media is starting to catch up. And I think Stephen Gutowski, among many, has been forcing Mm -hmm. that kind of conversation change um, in terms of accurate reporting, learning the nomenclature, and even kind of beyond showing defensive gun use. I wish, I remember, do you remember this Harvard 2007 study? I think John Lott co-authored this piece and Harvard had published it, then discontinued it, showing that um, lawful gun ownership helped curb crime compared to lack of gun ownership in totalitarian societies. And I wish there was more scholarship available on that. I don't know if you've had any thoughts on that or researched that as well. Well, yeah, I I mean, look, so there's there's a lot of data out there uh, about the importance of you're right. I, I wish there was more, but there there is a lot of data out there about the, the importance of of defensive gun use. Um, you know, b- between John Lott, Gary Kleck, uh, David Kopel has has done a whole lot. Um, you know, you want to look at really like macro level stuff. David Kopel uh, just recently, within the last year or so, published a study looking at um, it, essentially the the number of deaths that occurred in the 20th century because of totalitarian governments. Um, who had a essentially a monopoly on the instruments of the use of force and the number of their own unarmed civilians that they slaughtered, not in war, right, not combatants, um, but and it's something like 250 million, um, you know, just showing like, like the, the, the sort of importance of in armed citizenry generally against like these macro level threats. And when you bring that down to the, these more individual community level threats, you know, again, to see those numbers, and it's not just John Lott, um, and I know Gary Fleck has, has done a bunch on this, but also uh, Professor William English 
um, a, a Georgetown economics professor who just, again, within the last year, um, the, the most comprehensive study to date on defensive gun uses. Um, and he had the number at 1.6 million. You know, so so the data is out there, but you're right. We we need more because it does feel very one sided, uh, you know, in, in terms of data that that is skewed. And, and I think often intentionally so um, sometimes negligently, but often intentionally skewed um, to sort of misrepresent what the underlying problems are, you know, uh, or, you know, to, to misrepresent the importance of defensive gun use. Um but you're right. A lot of times it's just the lack of knowledge, you know, uh, and, and some of that just comes with the territory of defensive gun uses are hard to, to study precisely because it's self-reported. Right. So many of these are, are not going to end up in a police report somewhere or if they do, you know, you don't have access to that. There, there's no sort of comprehensive way to gather that. Um, so it is an unfortunate disadvantage when trying to study it. Um but I, I, I think actually a lot of people would be shocked at how much we do have given all of those limitations. And we contrast it, let's say, with Canada. And I think you probably have seen what is coming out of Canada. Not only have they banned semi-automatic mm-hmm. firearms, they've also even wanted to extend that ban to conventional hunting rifles, which you hear that here with all of the squabbles we have about regulating or not regulating firearms. And even with attempts to try to strip people of rights here, the Second Amendment largely insulates us from those type of machinations from happening. But you look up north to Canada, there's nothing protecting them essentially from that rewriting or erasure of gun ownership. Because I think in Canada, primarily hunting rifles and rifles in general are largely for hunting. It's not for self-defense purposes mm. up there. And you look to those countries and you think, oh my gosh, a Western country very much on the verge of stripping its citizens because there was nothing enshrined in its constitution to safeguard people's rights in the event of anything. And I feel very bad for Canadian friends and and people I know in Canada because I'm just like, oh my gosh, we really take this stuff for granted here. And I know President Biden has recently echoed kind of like Canada's Mm -hmm. call to ban firearms more so in the form of conflating semi-automatic firearms with assault weapons. (laughs) Right. Right. And similarly, pushing red flag laws without constitutional protections and other things. And so what has been your reading into some of his statements, the president's statements, and also um, kind of some under the radar things that have happened with recent mass shootings you were alluding to before we were recording the Colorado mm-hmm. shooter about why was the red flag law not activated in Colorado? So comment yeah, on both so, of those if you can. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot there. So I... <sighs> Look, I, I'm going to give President Biden the benefit of the doubt here that that he simply uh, very poorly, you know, misworded, misspoke when he called for a a ban on semi-automatic firearms. Uh, I, I my assumption is he meant, uh, you know, his traditional call to ban quote unquote assault weapons, um, which is problematic in and of itself. I, I mean, some assault weapons are nothing more than the same semi-automatic firearm in the same caliber, just without a, a pistol grip, right? There, there's nothing functionally different uh, about those firearms. Um, and it's sort of this like silly red herring that gun control groups throw out there to be like, you know, th- this is the big monster under the bed. And if we can just ban assault weapons, like everything will be fine. Um, which if you know anything about the stats and the data and even just the reality of, of how weapons work, it's, uh, you know, it would be, funny if it wasn't so deadly ridiculous um you know so i'll I'll give him the benefit of the doubt there um what was the second about red flag laws you were saying that kind of under the radar Mm -hmm. of this mass shooter in colorado springs we won't qualify with giving his name i'm really keen on not elevating those types of people due to the nature of copycats uh, but the individual in question, you said that he actually had some run-ins with the law before that should have triggered the so-called red flag law. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, I, I mean, look, at, at, at the at the end of the day, this comes down to this is less about red flag laws than it is about a, a bigger underlying issue we have in this country, which is with enforcement of existing laws as they already are on the books. Um, So when you look at what happened in Colorado, I I think it's really just indicative of a broader trend. If if you can't enforce existing laws or refuse to enforce existing laws, no law you pass is going to matter. It's not going to make a darn bit of difference. 
Um, so Colorado is one of the states that has a red flag law. I, you know, it's red flag law is not perfect. I, I think it is one of the better of the set of 20, but at the end of the day, they have one. And so this individual who committed a mass shooting at his club Q in Colorado Springs, uh, you look at his record. This is not an individual who should have had a firearm, just like most of these mass shooters. Um, so you go back uh, to last summer. This is an individual who was arrested with several felony charges because he called in a bomb threat, um, you know, held, I think it was his grandparents hostage, needed a, they, they had to evacuate the entire neighborhood. It turns out he didn't have a bomb, but if, if you are, you know, threatening to blow up a place and recording yourself as the crisis response team and, and SWAT teams are, are surrounding your door and you're, you're filming yourself saying, you know, if you breach, I'm going to take all of you with me. You know, essentially uh, telling the world that you are in a place where you want to commit mass violence against random strangers. You are not an individual. One, you're an individual who, you know, probably should be in jail. Those are some serious felony offenses. Uh, and, and two, you need you are what a red flag law was created. for. <laughs> essentially, you are someone who is a danger to yourself or others. And you look at what happened in that case. Those charges, for reasons that are have yet to be explained by the local district attorney, those charges were dropped. Uh, he he was never charged and never went to trial. The case was sealed so that it was never on his his record, and they never pursued any other means by which to disarm this individual who was apparently you know on camera loading loading a firearm, talking about how he wants to kill all the, all of these police officers when they come in. And, and, and how he was a danger to himself. That's not an individual who should have a firearm. You now have two different routes by which this individual should rightfully be disarmed. Now, we can talk about whether it should be temporary, whether that should be a lifelong disability, um, you know, how all of these systems need some means of getting him help that he clearly needs. But at the end of the day, both of those routes were ignored, both by the, the prosecutor on the criminal side, um, because if he's a felon, he can't legally buy those firearms, or on the red flag law side, uh, which is supposed to be a more targeted, limited intervention uh, to, to deal with people who are dangerous to themselves or others. And all of this is indicative of, again, just a bigger problem we have in this country of not actually using the means that we have readily available to ensure that dangerous people are not armed. Because this is this is not an issue of the vast majority of lawful gun owners being a danger to themselves or others. The millions and millions and millions of lawful gun owners in this country overwhelmingly will never, never even think about using their firearms to harm themselves or others. And certainly not in a, in a criminal context like that. But if you can't actually enforce the laws, if you can't or you won't enforce those laws about, uh, you know, disarming dangerous people, what good is a whole host of other laws telling those same dangerous people and non-dangerous people, okay, now you can't have a pistol grip, right? Now you can't have a forward grip. You can't have a collapsing stock. You know, if, you, if you're not willing to enforce the existing laws on them, how in God's name are you going to enforce you know, pistol grip bans on millions of Americans? It just doesn't make any sense. And, and again, I think it speaks to this bigger issue of how we talk about gun policy in this country. I don't know if it's been a definitive correlation established, but I think some people have pointed out to me that with the creation of more gun laws, we have started to see more violence um, involving guns in some capacity, not lawful gun uses, of course. But I don't know if it's statistically sound to say that, but someone was pointing that out to me. And I don't know if you've, you've caught that, too. But it seems like, yeah, they create these laws and then on the other end, they release people who are convicted of gun crimes from jail and they go back to repeat the same crime and crime again, even if there's strict gun control laws. I've seen recent incidences in Virginia. I remember after the several Northam decrees were signed into law to ban certain things and aspects here in Virginia. I remember someone was released from jail. They went to Fredericksburg or somewhere around there um, in that vicinity and uh, the person had a previous gun conviction and killed someone. And then obviously it was determined that he was released early and, you know, committed the same crime again, essentially on someone else. Mm -hmm. And it's just, and we see this with these rogue prosecutors too, that yeah. they release people in New York city, in Fairfax County, 
Virginia, all over the country that they claim to be for gun control. And then they release these people who have convictions involving crimes where, where firearms are used. So it doesn't hold water to me, that position, because they're not serious about crime reduction. It's more so about reduction of lawful gun ownership rather than a reduction right. of crimes involving firearms to me. So I think that's what most people see. And, and that's why we saw, I don't know if you've observed this, but there was, I think, another pretty groundbreaking day, Black Friday recently, where gun sales were pretty high up there compared to most recent years. Mm -hmm. More people are purchasing firearms lawfully, especially in wake of the Bruin decision and others. And, and with this Oregon initiative petition uh, 114, which is, I think, currently blocked, it's it's gone back and forth about whether they're implementing it immediately or after the new year. But people in Oregon, for instance, are going to purchase guns and they have to wait in long lines. And then they're finding out that there's a backlog of processing background checks. So it's kind of created a calamity in that situation. And, mm -hmm. and obviously those people are not, like you said, they're not going to go after purchasing their firearms for the most part and enact harm using those tools whatsoever. They want to get it because they see that these restrictions are coming. Although I think legal challenges will kind of put a check on that law. And then that um, new ballot initiative from going into effect, I know there are plenty of people already who have filed suit. And so it, it seems like there's an appetite for more lawful gun ownership among a wide swath of people, new um, demographics or demographics that you don't normally think have an interest in gun ownership. And so it seems like lawmakers are not getting with the times when we are starting to see these surges of firearms ownership. And so it, it makes it frustrates me as a commentator and as an observer why they're not catching up to reality that you have to come to grips with the Second Amendment. There are already laws in the books, some unreasonable, many unreasonable, some reasonable. Um, people want to follow the laws and they don't want to have obstacles to either obtain a firearm lawfully to get a concealed carry permit and have to, you know, jump through hoops and other right. things to have to just be able to exercise this in this country as we're able to do. Um, is there anything else, any other scholarship that my listeners should be aware of that you're doing? Um, yeah, well, so actually a lot of it deals with just the, those things that, that you're talking about. Um, you, you know, you, you mentioned how a, a lot of these, these politicians and gun control advocates, they sort of ignore reality. And I, I think that's true in, in several ways, right? Like, so, so they not just ignore the reality, you know, about what is an assault weapon. It, it, it's a deeper issue, right? So they ignore the plain data, right? And because they ignore the data, they then have a very skewed idea of what they actually need to do to address the problem. For example, um, some of my research focuses on who's actually committing crimes. We know that the, the data is very clear that most gun violence is perpetrated by a very, very small subset of repeat offenders who are already prohibited from owning firearms, who are by definition not going through lawful channels to get those firearms. They are going to people who are already willing to sell to felons to commit, you know, straw purchases, who are dealing in black market firearms. Um, you know, they're they're not showing up to a local gun store or even going through a private sale, right? They're either stealing the guns or getting them through through these already illicit channels. And so when you look at things like universal background checks or permits to purchase, um, essentially what you're doing is you're putting barriers in front of people who are already wanting to go through the process lawfully. You're not actually attacking the routes and avenues through which people who are already committing most crimes are already obtaining their firearms, right? So when you don't start with that reality, of who is committing gun violence and how they're getting their firearms, right? you end up just one, again, not addressing those avenues. And two, like you were talking about, like we've seen in Oregon um, and you know in, in Virginia with the one handgun a month ban, you're essentially just imposing more barriers for the same people who were already not committing violence. So a lot of my research focuses on, on those sorts of things. Very quickly, you know, I, I do want to touch on what you mentioned about sort of the, the growing, uh, the, the, not just the growing popularity of the Second Amendment, but sort of like the, the, the growing community that that encompasses. Uh, I, I think it has become increasingly evident um, that the Second Amendment community is expanding. Right? It's no longer just like your usual suspects. The number of, of women, minorities, um, you know, left-leaning individuals who for the first time in perhaps in their lives, you know, in the last two or three years looked around and said, I actually don't know that the police are going to be there if there's a criminal or, or if, you know, uh, 
you see sort of wide scale unrest. I actually don't know that the government's going to protect me. Um, I, I think that has created scenarios in which a lot of people who never considered buying a firearm for the first time in their life are like, yeah, no, I, I understand. I understand what this is all about, not just having a right to self-defense, but having the means to actually defend myself. Um, and I, I think you're seeing that more and more in even just the, the, the sort of growing types of people who are engaging with their Second Amendment rights for the first time. And I, I think it's very exciting to see that. Um, and I think that's going to be a big, um, you know, a big thing for the Second Amendment and its protection going forward is expanding that community and introducing people uh, to the importance of those rights for the first time. That's why they say two way is for everyone. That's a popular hashtag. And I've noticed this growth too, just even being engrossed in the reporting side of this since at least 2015, going to shot my first shot show, remembering that these statistics were just coming out and it was kind of showing a little bit of growth with women. And then in the last like four to five years, it's just exploded with a lot more diverse set of participants and users and demographics. And it's been amazing to see because these people are naturally inclining to gun ownership. They're wanting to learn more. People are welcoming them with open arms. There's very few barriers to be able to own a gun and to also do the subsequent training. And people are welcomed with open arms. I've never seen anyone turn away who's had a willingness to want to learn how to handle firearms safely. Um, you, they only turn away people who are bad with guns, uh, handling guns improperly and say, hey, learn how to actually handle them. But generally mm -hmm. speaking, most people, if they follow the safety protocols, they are welcomed. And it, it you have to grow in order to have those industry, industries sustain themselves. That's what people don't understand. But within the industry, you talk to anyone uh, NSSF, uh, individual manufacturers, they they say our, it's not so much about their bottom line, but our continuity as an industry revolves around future consumers or future buyers of our products. And we want to appeal to them. And so they open their arms and give resources to be able to accommodate that and, and fulfill that. And I think it's a wonderful thing. Nobody is saying that, yes, we're going to, I, I think what they say is um, people's support of the second amendment will change if people who are not white uh, own guns, which is a ridiculous, <laughs> ridiculous claim. I'm like, where do you get this from? Like, nobody's saying this. You're inventing this <laughs> a bizarre claim. So, Amy, if people want to follow your scholarship, connect with you, where would you like them to be sent? Well, you can always follow me on Twitter at Amy Swear. I'd also uh, highly encourage you, if, if you're on Twitter, follow our defensive gun use tracker. It's at DGU Daily. Um, uh, you can always read what what I'm doing and, and what my other colleagues are doing at at heritage.org um, or with our sort of multimedia arm, the daily signal.com. Um, but uh, for sure, most of the stuff I write, it's going to end up on Twitter. Um, but again, I'd, I'd encourage you to check out what, what all of my other colleagues are doing as well uh, out at heritage. Wonderful. We will include all those links. I want you to send me those studies and we'll be able to, and they should at the time of this show coming out, will be included. But I want to definitely link to those studies and I will to what you alluded to from Dave Copel and the gentleman from Georgetown University. Amy, it was wonderful to speak with you. I get to, I hope I get to speak and meet you at some point in the future in person at a DC area function. It would be great to connect with you in real life. And thanks so much for taking the time to speak with me and share what you know with our listeners and dispense your wisdom. Really appreciate it. Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me. Thanks for listening to District of Conservation. I hope you enjoyed today's episode. If you haven't already, make sure you find us on your preferred podcast player. We largely circulate on Apple, Spotify, and countless others, but those are our two big podcast platforms we want to push. Make sure you're subscribed there, especially on Apple. If you like the podcast a lot, go leave us some reviews. We'd be more than grateful to get some five-star reviews from you guys. Moreover, we are on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, and a little bit on YouTube. We don't populate there, but connect with us on social media. Find me personally on social media with blue check marks. Super easy to find, and I would love to hear your feedback and know who you'd like to see on the podcast. Thanks for listening to District of Conservation. Stay tuned for the next episode.